Hi, this is Hope. Welcome to the hopefully abbreviated version of the story of Dick, or Dick the Movie, uh, whatever you want to call it. This is the abbreviated version of what Dick Cheney did and why we all need to be aware of it. So we're going to start out in 1992 with one of the first things that Dick Cheney did, which was privatize war. 1992, Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense for the Gulf War, and he decided it would be a great idea to figure out if uh, private contractors could come in and do a lot of the military's work. So he paid $9 million to Kellogg, Brown, and Root, and they did a study on this, and they said, ah, fantastic an idea, we love it. And so he went right on from there and uh, decided that um, actually Kellogg, Brown, and Root got a $2.2 .2 billion contract off that at the time. So he was basically um, the architect of privatizing war. Um, secondarily, he um, became, let's see if I can point to it, uh, he joined um, American Enterprise Institute. This is American Enterprise Institute. Um, it is a um, pro-business right-wing think tank, and it basically um, represents all of the, great, uh, the huge corporations in America. We're talking Pepsi-Cola, Time Warner. Um, Chevron, Exxon, absolutely all of the big corporations, they're all corporate sponsors of American Enterprise Institute. And 20 American Enterprise Institute scholars ended up working in the Cheney administration. Also, uh, many of the books that they, were written, that they wrote and put out at the time were quoted as intelligence um, by the um, Cheney administration, and it definitely is the Cheney administration. Um, he is also a member of uh, Project for a New American Century, Actually, he helped to found this group with William Crystal, who is the grandfather of the neocon uh, movement. It's a think tank uh, project for American, new American century. A neocon think tank created to further the agenda of greater defense spending and unfettered U.S. global domination. They basically came on the scene just a little bit after um, the fall of the Soviet Union when America began to emerge as now potentially the only superpower. They decided that was a great idea and they put out a major policy piece that basically said America needed to be the unilateral power in the entire world and that we needed to increase defense spending so that we could achieve that. Seven of its signers of its major policy piece in 2000, um, which included regime change in Iraq as one of the major bullet points, seven of those signers ended up in Dick Cheney's um, high up in his administration. Dick Cheney is also a part of Carlyle Group, Car Carlyle Group is a huge investment firm controlling $13.5 billion in an investment portfolio. Um, they have huge def defense industry investments and are very well connected to um, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, um, uh, the f um, all, all kinds of uh, really high end <laughs> James Baker, all of these people who are big in government and also big in um, defense industry. So he is part of these three groups, American Enterprise Institute, Project for New American Century, and Carlisle Group. And so that's the kind of thinking that he really espouses. In 1995, he was brought into Halliburton as the CEO. He had one year experience in business, and he was brought in as the CEO of that company. Halliburton went immediately from being 73rd to being 18th on the Pentagon's list of contractors. They also sold pulse neutron generators to Libya. Libya which was against the law at the time. Uh, they had to fight, pay a great fine for that. They were also the main supplier to Iran and Iraq for their oil infrastructure. They were actually selling to countries which we, um, it was illegal to sell to at the time. And Cheney was a great proponent of doing away with any kind of sanctions or embargoes. He thought business should be able to, he thought they should be able to sell stuff to Libya and uh, Iraq and Iran. Um, uh, Halliburton was fired from uh, their uh, government contract, and then they were rehired later for overbilling. They overbilled frequently. Um, during his time there, they also increased their offshore tax havens fivefold, so that in 2002, Halliburton only paid $15 million of its $80 million tax burden um, to the American government. They also support um, unequivocally only Republican candidates. Um, donating 95% of their um, campaign contributions to strictly Republican candidates. So, you know, they get the people in, in the government to give them the contracts, and then they go out and run the companies, and it, something called a military-industrial complex. Um, as soon as he becomes vice president, it is immediately apparent that he is hell-bent for war in Iraq. Now, he became even more so after 9-1-1, but even previous to that, 
Um, from day one, he was counseled by the FBI, the CIA, and the NSC counterterrorism officials that al-Qaeda, bin Laden, and the Taliban were the most important um, and egregious eminent threat in America. He absolutely would not listen. He would go frequently to the CIA to check on this and ask about Iraq all of the time. Um, many other officials that were um, Project for a New American Century and American Enterprise Institute officials also frequently argued um, that uh, long before 9-1-1 that I Iraq was the real point. Um, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSC completely disagreed. Um, they did not feel that, uh, that that was correct in any way. But anyone who disagreed with the Cheney administration was called paranoid, and they were frequently demoted. Because they didn't like the information that they were getting from the CIA, um, he started his own intelligence system within his administration. And in, in this was directly after 9-1-1. As soon as 9-1-1 happened, the CIA knew that it was al-Qaeda. And the Bush administration had been warned. Um, but Cheney was not getting the right information, he was uh, sure, from the CIA. So he started his own intelligence system within his administration. It was called the Office of Special Plans. It was also peopled by people from um, Project for a New American Century, American Enterprise Institute, and Carlisle. Instead of hiring intelligence officials to get intelligence, they hired politically connected policy analyzers. And they just simply used un unchecked, unvetted, uh, single source information. And that's what you heard all of the time in the speeches um, that they went around the country um, doing all of the time. Um, George Tennant, the head of the CIA, was briefed repeatedly by the head of the bin Laden de the department. That was the, um, the part of NSC that was watching after bin Laden, that invading Iraq would break the back of our counterterrorism program. He repeatedly briefed Bush about this. But Cheney's view was we had absolutely had to go into Iraq. Um, before we did that, though, we did decide within a month of 911 to go into Afghanistan, which was actually where um, the Taliban was. Cheney had a huge fight with the CIA. Cheney, Cheney and his department um, wanted to run the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, but they had absolutely no plans for it. The military um, had no plans on the shelf for that. The CIA was ready to go. And so Bush hired the CIA for the job, which really pissed Cheney off. It was a body blow to him. Um, so the CIA went in initially. They did a great job, and they, you know, they did all the groundwork, and then they waited for the military to come. The military would never come. The military never did come. They really didn't care about Osama bin Laden, as far as I can tell. They left the CIA on the ground for weeks and weeks and weeks, and finally, when the CIA complained, Rumsfeld went to Bush and said, hey, look, man, I need to run this war. You need to put the CIA underneath my governance, or this is not going to work. And so Bush gave um, uh, Cheney the oversight, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld, of the Afghanistan war. They went in immediately and made short work of the Taliban. It was actually pretty fast. Kabul fell pretty quickly. And then later that winter, they actually ended up doing the same thing. Um, the CIA started to move forward. They knew where bin Laden was, and they were going into the mountains to get him. And they did ask for backup in the military. The army just basically said, nope, we're not coming, not going, not going to be there. Sorry. For some reason, we spend half of our budget on the military, on our defense spending. And when we need them, they just say, hey, no thanks. And so they did not have the support that they needed. And ultimately, they did not have the victory that we all needed at that time. Because if we had taken care of them in Afghanistan, which would have been smart, uh, we wouldn't have had this continuing problem. We wouldn't have had the war in Iraq which is currently making absolutely no sense to anyone. So we decide immediately, as soon as we've missed bin Laden in Afghanistan, this is in 2001, um, that we're going to go into Iraq. And we immediately start to move our uh, soldiers in that direction. And see, uh, um, uh, different people in the government are told, even very early on, that that is where we're going. And so we have this very long uh, build up to this where Cheney is going out along with Rumsfeld and Rice and giving all of these speeches and the intelligence that they were using for those speeches they knew at the time was actually not good intelligence. They knew that they were making it up. If you begin to read about that and, re and follow that story, they were completely aware that yellow cake, the aluminum tubes, Mohammed Atta, they had been told by the CIA that they were using er erroneous information. And actually what they did in the end is they blamed it on the CIA, um, who had told them that it was wrong. But they got away with it. And so George Tennant, who was the head of the CIA, actually ended up re uh, resigning after that. 
Um, three months into the war, the first three months of the war went in one particular direction. We were going to have a short war. We were going to install uh, Iraqi leaders and go ahead and get right out of there within about four to six months, maybe. It cost 50 to 80 billion dollars was the thinking. Um, about three months into that, we did a complete 180. And secretly, a few men in Washington, D.C. made some decisions. There were about four of them, um, Cheney, uh, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, probably Fife. Um, very, very, very foggy information on that, but there were four of them. They did not consult with the CIA. They did not consult with the FBI, counterterrorism. Any government officials currently running Iraq, they did not consult with the military on the ground in Baghdad, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or the State Department, or the President. They made these decisions. What they did is they hired a new guy. His name was Paul Bremer, Jerry Bremer. And only 10 days before he left for Iraq did they hire him. He was in D.C. for 10 days. And then he took off to basically run, be, be uh, in charge in Baghdad. He had five specific decisions that he was given by these four people. This is the key point of the war um, that puts it all in perspective. If we had stuck with that original plan, we could have been out of there in four to six months. Um, and the war would have been over. We would have had no war. Good God, how would Halliburton make money? Can't have that. So we, <laughs> we came in with these five decisions. The first decision that we had is we decided not to stop the looting that was going on. Now keep in, in, in mind, Baghdad is 6.5 million people. Um, Los Angeles is four, just a little less than 4 million people. So if you can imagine the entire city of Los Angeles with no police, no army, no security whatsoever, what in the world would happen? Good God, I think we'd have looting. You'd kind of know that if you remove the security from an area that had that many people, um, you're going to have some problems. But we had decided to go in with a much smaller military than was needed. Um, military officials had said that we needed at least 200,000 troops. Donald Rumsfeld wanted 100,000 and no more. He fought with them for quite a long time. They ended up, I think, with 140. And so we had no troops to take care of looting. Um, so what happened, uh, Baghdad actually experienced um, $12 billion worth of looting which was their GDP for two years in a row. Um, museums, everything was looted. The second thing they decided to do was fire all government employees, including teachers and librarians. Absolutely everyone, so they all were immediately fired. The third thing they decided, that Bremer decided to do, and this was the most controversial, was to fire the entire army. Now the army had already been wanting to come back and now aid in the future of the country. We thought we were gonna have democracy or some kind of freedom or you know, some kind of liberty or something. Uh, anyway, um, and in fact, two days before Bremer left, President George, President George W. Bush had said to keep all of the battalions in down, so about half of the army at least he had wanted to keep. And those men were there and they were ready to go. They were immediately fired by Bremer. Now what, this happ what happened then is we had 500,000 unemployed men with no way to feed their families, and these men often supported extended families because the job situation there was fairly difficult. So they're not only able not to feed their families, but extended family. And it ended up with 27% as a conservative estimate uh, unemployment in Baghdad. So you have 27% unemployment, and what else did we decide to do? Oh darn, we're not going to guard the munitions. So we had three tons of live munitions, which these guys knew where they were, and they came and carried those away. We had no ability you know, the, the soldiers were just standing around going, oh well, you know, that's not our job. And the last thing that they did not do is provide any security on the streets whatsoever. If you can imagine being a city of 6.5 million people um, with a unemployment level of almost 30, probably 30 percent, and um, three tons of munitions have been sent out into that population, ooh, we're going to have a little bit of trouble. Um, this is not a good idea. I mean, I can't imagine that anyone in their right mind would think that any of those were good ideas. Uh, but the one thing they did provide is a long and extended war and a lot of work for the private contractors who came after. One last point on Bremer. There was an, a National Intelligence Council report. The National Intelligence Council is part of the CIA. It was an estimate on Iraq and what would happen in the insurgency. It was a 13-volume report. It took up a whole shelf. Bush never read any, any of it. He never even read the one-page executive summary. He had absolutely no desire to read anything or do anything different than what they were doing. So 
what happens now is we have private contractors coming in. Remember, Dick Cheney thought of this idea back in the Gulf War. In the Gulf War, the ratio of private contractors to contractors was 60 to 1. 60 soldiers to one private contractor. The ratio in the Iraq War is one, private, one soldier to 1 1.4 private contractors. So we have more private contractors now than we have regular soldiers. Very interesting. Um, in 2008, there were 160,000 military, 200,000 contractors, and 48,000 armed civilian guards. Um, so that was a big change, and that was something specifically that, that Dick Cheney uh, had started long, long ago. Uh, the U.S. spends $2 billion a week in Iraq. Um, Forty cents of every dollar that Congress controls goes to private contractors. It's amazing. All private contractor profits are undisclosed. Cash from America was brought in on pallets and handed out off of pallets, and actually 200 pallets were lost um, by Halliburton at the time. Some of the bigger companies that are working there right now, Bechtel has a $2.3 billion contract, and even though it failed to complete it, it was still paid the total. KBR has a $32 billion contract. That's five times the cost of the Gulf War just for KBR. Parsons has a $5 billion contract and completed only six of the 142 health clinics that it was supposed to build. Halliburton has an at least $10 billion contract, $1.8 billion of which is completely unaccounted for, and they just doggone don't know what they did with it. Um, the original projected cost of war was $50 to $80 billion. Um, right now, the value of contracts that we have is $300 billion. Um, over five years, and 40% of all department um, contracts are no-bid contracts. So these are no-bid contracts that also have something called cost plus. So the idea here is the more money that you spend, the more money you make. If you spend a lot of money, you make a lot of money. It sounds like a really great way to save money, doesn't it? Um, okay. Another thing to remember, contractors in Iraq are not under any kind of law. They're not under Iraqi law, and they're obviously not under American law. They're able to do anything that they want. They can murder um, innocent civilians there, and they cannot be held accountable for that. Up to a year after we went into the Iraq war, Bush was completely unaware of this. He was asked about this at a news conference, and he basically laughed and made a joke of it. And at that time, 15... Um, um, Iraqi citizens had been murdered uh, by American contractors and there was absolutely nothing that could be done about it. Um, the CEO of Titan in uh, 04 and 05, his salary was 47 million. Titan hires untrained and untested interpreters. The CEO of Khaki, um, Khaki was hired for clerical and IT work. They ended up being um, in employing civilians as interrogators at Abu Ghraib. Those interrogators were found to be guilty of heinous acts of torture. The military that were involved in that incident are spending years in prison. The private contractors who were involved in that incident got away scot-free. And the CEO of Khaki made $22 million in 2004 in a personal, personal income. The CEO of Halliburton um, in 2003 made $47 million. Remember, that's just directly right straight out of our pockets. Oh well, yeah, that's taxpayer money. Um, they cut services at every opportunity to enhance their profits. They spoiled their staff with fleets of new upgraded SUVs for employees who never drove. Remember, the more they spend, the more they make. They put employees up in five-star hotels with five-star meals while the army slept in moldy tents. If a computer or a truck lost a part or popped a tire, it was burned because they didn't have extra parts. They couldn't think that far ahead. So they were burning $80,000 trucks in front of starving Iraqis. This is the idea of democracy, I guess, that we're bringing. We're going to bring freedom, right? 63 of their 67 water treatment plants. Now, remember, this is, George, uh, this is Cheney's old company. 63 of their 67 water treatment plants were contaminated with malaria, typhus, and giardia, and more and more and more than, than that, actually. They kept a feeding schedule of the troops of breakfast, lunch, and dinner and made the troops stand out in the desert for an hour at the time waiting for food as sitting ducks because they wouldn't go to a 24-hour feeding schedule because it cost them too much money. They would charge the army $100 a bag for laundry and return the laundry in worse shape than it came in, but the soldiers were required to do their laundry through Halliburton. It was illegal to do it yourself. They charged taxpayers for convoys carrying nothing, and I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg. Blackwater is another company that was in Iraq. 
Um, four contractors were killed because of Blackwater negligence. They rolled a convoy on a day when they never should with no, um, they didn't follow the requirements. And it was a red day. No one should have been on the streets. So they rolled it anyway. Um, the next day they were lobbying in D.C. and they lobbied the right people. They ended up getting more contracts than they had before and they suffered no damage from having four of their um, employees killed by negligence. Um, how did this go on? How did this keep going? And no one noticed. Well, what was happening behind the scenes at the time, back in D.C. in the Dick Cheney administration, um, we had a, uh, an interesting um, clash of ideas. Dick Cheney, from the time that he was working with Nixon and Reagan, believed that the president should have all supreme power. He watched what happened to Nixon. Um, Nixon had broken into to an office and he was actually, he had to leave because he was doing illegal activity. Um, Reagan ha had the Iran-Contra affair. He was selling arms to Iran. Um, and Cheney's perspective was that both Reagan and Nixon should have been able to do those activities. They should not have any oversight um, from any committee or any Congress that basically the president runs everything and no one um, no one can uh, basically say anything to him about that. And so Dick Cheney used his uh, lawyer in uh, D.C., David Addington, and they wrote uh, quite a number of position papers which gave, like, covering torture, covering rendition, covering um, what would happen with uh, prisoners, wiretapping, data gathering. And he just basically decided that George W. Bush should be able to do absolutely anything he wanted and he should not have congressional oversight. The way that they got around congressional oversight is when uh, Congress would pass a law and Bush would go to sign the law, at the same time that he signed the law, he signed a signing statement that said he didn't have to follow that law. Um, George Bush signed, uh, let's see, Bush signed um, 152 signing statements, 78 percent of which um, basically said he didn't have to follow those laws. And so that covered over a thousand different laws that George W. Bush just said, I don't need to follow these. And so that was how he got away with it. And actually the American Bar Association came out in 2006 and did a study on that and said it was completely unconstitutional. Um, it said it was abhorrent to our type of governance. Um, he's actually required to do a veto if he is not going to sign that bill, he vetoes it. That's what the law is. But they would just circumvent the law um, all the time. And so that's how they got away with it. Um, all of the strings that they pulled at that time are very interesting. It's an interesting story. It's a little bit of a long story. Um, but they pulled so much wrangling and infighting that actually the head of the CIA, um, the head of the FBI, and the head of the... Um, Office of Legal, Legal Counsel all threatened to quit, to resign, uh, because they were so up in arms, because what they were actually writing and doing was actually unconstitutional and illegal. But if you put the whole picture together, what you have is an idea of world domination. We have world domination coming in from Project for an American Century, which said America should be the only global power. And then we also have that mixed like a Molotov cocktail with um, Cheney's ideas on presidential supremacy. So what you have here is one world leader. Not virtually, but specifically and exactly one world leader. Now the terrifying thing about that is that one world leader was George W. Bush or Dick Cheney, you know, whichever one you want to pick. But if you look at the body of evidence of the choices that they made at the time, um, and the things that they did, you can see why we have a three-pronged government, so that we have oversight. There's a reason why we have checks and balances, not checks and bonuses. That is Constitution. That is following the Constitution. That's the way that it's made to be. We have oversight for a specific reason. And this is the specific reason why. Now, this has specifically just run amok. It has run completely amok. But if you go out today and look on the television set and see what's going on in the media, you wouldn't know it. Because most Americans don't know this stuff. And why is that? Because the media is wrapped up like a birthday present with a lot of tape. And so right now, today as I speak, 
Dick Cheney has a higher favorability rate in Gallup polls than Nancy Pelosi. Now, what in the world has Nancy Pelosi done compared to this? Could you tell me? What, what has Nancy Pelosi done? The thing that, that's happened with Nancy Pelosi is she is demonized on a daily basis on ch channels like Fox News and every right-wing uh, talk channel you can possibly think of. And so I, we, I don't know that people actually know why they hate her, except she's a Democrat. Um, but they definitely don't know why we hate Cheney, because I don't see how you could, you know, put the two next to each other. But right now, as of today... Pelosi has a lower approval rating than Dick Cheney. And the thing that's amazing is he's going out right now on, a, on another lying tour. And if you noticed, it was a project, it was a American Enterprise Institute where he was speaking that invited him for that last round of speeches, which was on the same day as Barack Obama. Basically, just he's just standing up for all of this and saying that this is fantastic. This is what we should have done. This kept us safe, invading the wrong country letting Osama bin Laden go, that made us safe, breaking the law, breaking the Constitution, uh, but nobody, nobody has any idea. And actually, that's working for him. Um, in March of 2009, his approval rating among Republicans was 64%. Um, as of May of 2009, his uh, approval rating among Republicans went up to 70%. So he enjoyed a six-point rise in uh, three months. Um, among the general public in 09, his general approval rating was 21%. As of May of 09, it had gone up to 37%. Among Republicans, 76% of Republicans do not think that the Iraq War was a mistake. 21% of the normal general public think it was a mistake. I, or that could have been Democrats, I, I'm not really quite sure. Only 14% of the general public, that's everybody, thinks that the war went badly, or very badly. Um, so they're just out there saying how they kept us safe. And in fact, what they did is they answered 4,000 American deaths with 4,000 more completely, plus with the deaths in, of American soldiers in Iraq, completely unnecessary American deaths. Um, the soldiers that died in Iraq, I don't think that they felt they were kept safer. Um, and why were why 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 did we do this? If you look at the chain of events, it's almost obvious exactly why we did this. This plan to go into Iraq was put out by PNAC um, back in the 90s. Regime change in Iraq had to do with our um, global dominance in the area. Definitely had to do with oil. Although it ends up in the end, we didn't get any of those contracts anyway. Um, I'll tell you who's not safer. The Iraqi people were not safer. The chance of dying a violent death in Baghdad went up 400% as soon as we came. Um, at least a million innocent men, women, and children have died um, since our invasion. How many more are wounded? How many more are homeless? How many more hate America now? I don't see how that kept us safer. Um, at least 160,000 American soldiers have been seriously wounded and injured, many of which who will now be permanently disabled and we will be paying for the rest of their lives. Um, as well we should. Uh, the new administration that's actually in Iraq that was elected in 2006 is mostly tied to religious fundamentalism in Iran. And so to think that we got a democracy, what we have there now is kind of a soup of all kinds of fundamentalists. Um, the interesting thing about Saddam Hussein is Saddam Hussein's regime was a secular regi regime. It was a secular regime. It was a non-religious regime. A secular re regime would never uh, cohort, which is what they used to say, you know, Saddam Hussein cohorts with terrorists. That was something they used to quote quite a bit. That's absolutely silly. Um, that's like saying that uh, Bill Clinton cohorts with, um, who's a fundamentalist preacher, Pat Roberts or something. I mean, it's, it's oil and water. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, and so that's the story of the Iraq War. This was supposed to take 10 minutes. I don't know how in the world I'm going to get it down to 10 minutes. Um, but I do want to end with, with two quotes. The first one is this. There is no flag large enough to cover the killing of innocent people. And secondarily, the end, or not, it's up to you.